Life is too short to work at a crappy company. That's why Software Engineering Daily is proud to be sponsored by Hired.com, the job marketplace for software engineers. If you accept a job through Hired, they will give you a $2,000 bonus. But as an extra bonus to our listeners, you can get an additional $2,000. That's $4,000 total if you sign up by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com and using the link on the right side of the page to sign up. Hired.com will set you up with five great companies for interviews. These are companies like Stripe, Facebook, Uber, companies you would actually want to work for, where you can go and learn the cutting edge of software engineering. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com, click on the banner on the right, and try out Hired.com. Rebecca Garcia is the creator of Geek Girl Web and the co-founder of Coder Dojo NYC. She spends much of her time educating people about the importance of STEM education, particularly in the domain of programming. Rebecca, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I'm really excited to uh, share more about um, STEM education. Yes, so I want to start off by talking about that. Um, You spend so much of your time educating people about programming what was the path that led you to believing that this was something of such importance that you had to spend time on a regular basis educating people about programming and STEM more broadly? Yeah. So when I was younger, um, I had an interest in computers, but I didn't really know what to do with it at the time. There weren't really any role models um, with careers in technology or programming, and I didn't really know what was out there. Um, My sister made an investment in me, as I like to call it, and she sponsored me to go to um, a computer camp at MIT. And I really enjoyed it. I met all these other kids who thought, you know, building stuff on your computer was cool and, and it was creative and it was fun. And that really changed things for me. It changed my perspective being exposed to that. Um, So I'd already started teaching myself um, basic programming um, before then, but now I saw it in a new light. And so I ended up going to um, teach at that program uh, later on. And then um, when I moved to New York City and I decided to be a developer full time, I was like, man, I wish there was something like this where I could give back and Um, you know, there wasn't anything at the time because I realized that like the program I had gone to is, you know, inaccessible for most families. Um, it's about a thousand dollars a week, not including food or accommodations. Um, and so I wanted something that was more accessible. And so, um, I helped co-found Coder Dojo NYC, which is part of a global movement of free coding clubs for youth. And I just like love this idea of being able to give back and share your profession and what you do and um, really having this one on one mentorship experience. So I am, uh, you know, I recently signed up for this hour of code thing or like, uh, I, I guess as part of the hour of code, I signed up to potentially you know, help mentor people through code.org. And I think this is going to involve spending time with uh, probably younger people uh, talking about coding and stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I'm really curious if you have any pointers on when you're introducing people to programming for the first time, how do you approach it? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. I think that... Um, you know, keeping in mind that people have very different learning styles is, is something that we do um, at Coder Dojo. So um, some people are more hands on, which it's kind of nicer to get into, um, you know, circuits and have some like physical hardware, like little bits. Other people are more visual. And so um, diving more into um, design kind of things or like scratch for younger kids where it's drag and drop visual programming is another approach. Um, versus just kind of thinking, oh, well, this person or young person is going to pick it up right away, just straight up, you know, um, like writing code uh, might be like a difficult approach versus kind of slowly introducing them to the fun concepts of programming. And um, I think a lot of the great tools at code.org and um, Scratch and Mozilla Webmaker and Thimble, like all these really great tools um, kind of introduce um, in different ways. So let's zoom out a bit. I guess, why is it so crucial to expose kids to programming? 
So I think that it's not just because, you know, we want people to become, you know, the next big hotshot programmer or, or startup entrepreneur. It's really a matter of giving people access to that education where they don't have access to it to begin with. Most people don't um, understand, um, you know, how things work. And it's really changing the mindset of um, helping people become creators through technology and not just consumers. And so understanding how things work and this way, even if they decide they don't want to become a programmer, just like you learn how to read and write, um, learning, you know, to program or learning like the fundamentals of, you know, computer science, I think is, is helpful because then you know what you want to do. You decide, oh, well, I don't, I'm not as interested in this, or it could spark something bigger and you could be interested in um, a facet of STEM. One thing that I heard you discuss on the Code Newbie podcast was uh, your uh, you're, you're a fan of Seth Godin, who I had on the podcast recently, and I, that was actually like pretty big deal for me. Like Seth Godin's probably, uh, I mean, this sounds maybe fanatical, but he's probably the closest thing to like a uh, like a religious leader type figure <laughs> that that uh, that I've ever you know, encountered like his, his material is just really good. And one of the things that he talks about, which you echoed when you were talking in this podcast was, um, you know, he talks about the way that the world is shifting. Um, and it, it, it changes the careers that are getting rewarded. So, um, and he also talks about like how there's a disconnect between the curriculum that gets taught to people all like all through college, like, even like certainly in elementary school, middle school, high school, but also all through college. What is the disconnect um, between the antiquated curriculum that we have and the way that that things should be taught? And how can how can you bridge that gap? when you are exposing kids to programming for the first time? Yeah, so I think that that's really great. I think uh, thinking of it from that perspective. So um, some schools and some universities and colleges are starting to shift and have a focus on entrepreneurship. But I think one of the big things is um, we go through life and like school as mostly like school, especially you go through it as like a solo sport, right? So it's like you're about your grades, even if you're on a project, right? You're like, I got to get good grades or, um, you know, here's that paper, you know, I need a good grade for that paper. Um, but in reality, when you actually get to the working real world, you know, you have to work together on a team most of the time. And we forget that shift in like being able to communicate with people. Um, and we forget that there is that social aspect and programming is like that. You know, there's um, there's a really great quote that I like um, that's something, uh, you know, in relation to diversity and technology, which is, you know, um, software, you know, engineering projects um, don't fail because of like lack of technical ability. They fail because of, you know, lack of communication. Um, so I think, um, introducing youth to programming and STEM education in general is, it's a different way of thinking. And this way they can also understand how other people might approach problems as well. So do you, are you saying you, you, fo you think, uh, collaboration is a big, is a big aspect of bridging this gap? Yeah, definitely. I think collaboration is, is something that we're, we're really big on because, um, so, for example, in our in our workshops, you know, we tell the kids, you know, hey, before you ask help from your mentor, you know, who's, you know, who's giving their time, like ask the person on your left and ask the person on your right. And um, a lot of the times it's it's the first time that they can really um, start to get to build things that they care about or on their own. And like the first time we get them to also those, those who want to get to present their projects. And it's the first time they're not being like assigned, you know, a president to write a book report on, or, you know, it's, it's, it's something different. It's like, sometimes they're sort of stuck. They're like, you want me to, to do what you want me to like come up with my own ideas and come up, you know, there's this other aspect of, of, I think technology, which is the creative side. And I think it's so awesome that we get to expose them to it. Isn't it like bone chilling when you encounter that type of thing where they're like, wait, so you want me to be creative? I don't know. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> they're like, what, what uh, do you want me to memorize? I'm so confused. <laughs> okay. So, but you, we know what's crazy is that 
this is this happens with like adults. Like if you talk to adults, they'll be like, if you put me in a situation where I don't have rules to follow, like I'm gonna go crazy. Yeah, totally. The one of the things that I, I like to ask people I've started doing instead of saying, Hey, you know, what do you do for a living? Or, you know, where do you work? Or, you know, kind of these sort of standard questions. Like, I like to ask people, what are you passionate about? And that kind of stops them in their tracks for a second. Like, <laughs> uh, I don't know, what am I passionate about? And then Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to come up with either a funny answer or a real answer. And you kind of get to know them a bit better from there instead of you know, <laughs> surface level. One thing I'm kind of like worried about it when, uh, you know, cause I'm, cause I'm going to try to be doing this programming education type of stuff, um, is, you know, um, so I, 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 this is kind of a tangent, but it'll come back. Um, I saw, I watched this YouTube video of, um, one of the, uh, the Palantir co-founders, uh, named, uh, Joe Lonsdale. Um, and he, he was giving a talk at um, at some high school, and he was talking about how um, how like the last time he had given a talk at a high school, he had gotten basically thrown off the stage because he was basically trashing the I, the things that high school um, you know espouses are really important: SAT scores, following the rules, just all this crap that actually is like not really correlated with with real world success and he was like saying he had gotten thrown out for for basically advocating that students should kind of buck the system a little bit and um and so i'm worried about like if you know if i go to a classroom and i'm like talking to some kids and i'm like kind of you know espousing this 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 type of stuff like the type of stuff seth godin would say for example you know do i need to like tone it down a little bit to uh, to, you know, make myself bland enough for the adults in the room? So the funny thing is, um, even though I'm an advocate for STEM education, you know, I do, I do a bit of like public speaking to, um, like educational places, whether that's universities or, um, you know, other organizations. And I actually, um, I stopped out of college. So it's always funny that I now go and speak to places of higher education and I think that alone is kind of like a little rebellious, but at the same time, you know, I, I think that as long as you're, you're doing it with positivity in mind and not, um, not being like talking down on like, well, the system, right. You know, but it, it but being like, Hey, here are these other ways of doing things and other ways of thinking and ways you can push yourself forward. Um, that is really what, you know, cause you, I think people don't get exposure to enough um, real role models or enough people who are going to be, um, you know, not cookie cutter. So I always think it's refreshing to hear, you know, different people speak on from different backgrounds. Mm. So I take it you've never been thrown out of one of those public speaking gigs? No, but I <laughs> haven't been thrown out. But um, I've definitely been asked, you know, like, wait, how old are you? Like, people are like a little, <laughs> you know, they're like, what's going on? But um, no, that hasn't happened just yet. So hopefully not. <laughs> so I know you're you're big on, you know, the whole STEM education stuff and the, you know, more people should learn to code type of movement. Um, what is your take on kind of the changing, the shifting conversation in uh, in programming education and like boot camps versus universities? Like, um, for example, I, I you know, I've done a bunch of shows with, coding boot camps and my opinion has shifted back and forth between uh the importance of university versus you know can you just get everything out of a boot camp or get everything out of just going to internships mm -hmm. or doing freelance work or something can you give yourself the education that is equivalent to um a university education um so and like epitomizing this is you know i had a conversation yesterday with um, Dave Parker, who is a who is the CEO of Code Fellows, which is a boot camp, and um, and he was saying that he had had a conversation with some computer science professors, and they were just like, you know, these boot camps they just don't work; hmm. they're never going to work. So, and I was like, yeah, what like terrible old old values? <laughs> but anyway, I mean, what's 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 your perspective on on this whole 
this whole movement? Yeah. So I think um, coding boot camps serve also a different purpose. So I'm I'm not hating on the traditional education system. I think some people learn better in that sort of um, structured, more more tiered structured way. Um, and there are some really great programs out there. But for coding boot camps, I think it's different because you also get a lot of people who um, are coming from a career change where going back to university might not be as feasible for them, like going back um, versus being able to just do something in like two or three months. And I feel like the beauty of the coding schools is also that they're because they're not tied to a traditional education system. Usually, um, they're able to iterate on the curriculum faster. So the curriculum is usually more up to date than universities, at least from what I've seen. Um, so that sort of like startup style lets them um, try to you know innovate a little bit more. Um, and another thing that I, I kind of like is that. Um, a, a lot of times the people who are teaching at coding boot camps um, are also not coming from traditional backgrounds, but they also, a lot of them used to be software engineers or they used to be programmers and they've gone through that experience versus, you know, I really admire people who are in academia, but sometimes it's a little different from what you need to learn in the working world. So I think it can be hit or miss depending on, on the school or the coding boot camp. So mm. I think I think it's definitely worth looking into if, if people are interested. And um, honestly, I wish instead of school, I wish that there were coding boot camps when I was going before going into school, because I think um, that definitely would have jump started me more into web development versus um, in college, I had started studying business management, which was which was useful. Um, but I think uh, the reason I stopped out of school was because I found I was learning faster through um, through con contract work that I was doing, internships that I had kind of gotten on my own based on my own um, programming experience, not from prior work experience. So, like, let's say the code, I mean, these coding boot camps are rising in popularity and enrollment. And it also seems like the supply side of, or, or I guess, demand side of the jobs, the job market. Uh, that is hungry for coding bootcamp graduates. It's not going anywhere. Um, there's still there's going to be plenty of jobs. So if you know if coding bootcamps rise in number and they rise in acceptance, um, how how young do you think we're going to uh, see see students enrolling in these bootcamps? Like for example, I I remember in high school there were you know these whiz kids that would take, uh, you know, um, community college classes and they'd be in like 10th grade and taking community college classes. Uh, you know, are we going to see people jumping out of high school and, and going into coding boot camps? you think? I think there might be a shift in that, but then also there's the whole self-taught movement. So, um, for example, um, one of the girls who's come through our Coder Dojo program, um, she is 12. She's been with us since she was about, um, nine, I think she's been with us a few years and, um, through like some of our other programs, she started learning iOS app development. She, um, she got some press this year or this past year because, um, she was the youngest recipient of a WWDC scholarship. So the, um, the big, uh, Apple, uh, developer conference. And, um, so she actually didn't meet the age requirement. She had to like write a letter <laughs> saying like, Hey, I'm, <laughs> Hey, I'm 12. Will you let me in? Here's like my sample code or something. Um, and so I think even before coding boot camps, we already have all of these amazing kids who are, um, self-taught and self-motivated. You know, let's focus a little more and talk about the, the education process at Coder Dojo NYC. So I'm really curious about the, the tactics of teaching kids to code. Uh, you know, like when you, when you go to, uh, when you go to a Coder Dojo and you, you're sitting in front of a bunch of people who have uh, never been exposed to programming before, I mean, what are the, what are the best the best tactics to introducing them to programming when they really have no idea, um, you know, w what programming is? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so the way that I kind of like to think of our workshops, and we call them workshops in the sense that, um, you know, it's a specific time to kind of get to learn something, not in the 
formal sense um, of, you know, having one teacher and 30 students, um, we actually have like to have a one to one mentor ratio. So one mentor per one kid or so. Um, so it's a one on one hands on experience. And it's kind of like a hackathon in a way, um, because you kind of you kind of hit the ground running. Um, and like I mentioned, we have some of the kids um, present their stuff at the end. So uh, that's kind of like the self motivation too is being able to say like, I built this thing, you know, in this amount of time, and here it is, let me present it to you. But um, so getting these kids started when they've never programmed before kind of looks like, um, hey, are you interested in, you know, something um, visual like Scratch? So for the younger kids, um, we use Scratch, uh, which is a drag and drop visual programming tool. Um, and then for a little bit, kids that are a little bit older, we'll start them off in HTML and CSS because um, there's a lot of uh, sort of visual validation as well. So they'll be able to see their results right away. Um, and then from there, we also have um, little bits. So like circuits, the little snap together circuits. So that's that's something very hands on as well. And you can explain concepts with it. Um, and then kids who are a bit older who have already experienced any of those things um, might be interested in something a bit more advanced like Ruby or Python or Java. Um, you know, so those kids can definitely who have already understood some of those basic concepts can then move on to something more advanced. So everything that we do is project based with the idea that um, whatever you build in that time span, you can take it home and continue working on it. So it's different from like, OK, you learn the ABCs and then next week we're going to teach you, you know, whatever else. So you don't need all of those components right away. You can kind of, um, you know, plug and play when you get home and figure out what the next step is. Um, so all of our curriculum is pretty much open source and we generally use like all open source technology as well. Um, so that kind of makes it uh, a bit easier on us because then the kids who are really excited can go home and be like, oh, this is what I learned and here's here's more of like what I can put together and build. So it sounds like it's, so it's totally a one-on-one -on -one tutorial model is that what you're saying a little bit yeah so the idea is that um you know they can come up with an idea we'll give them some uh a little bit of a framework and say you know here here are some ideas so for example we'll have a theme so for um october it could be halloween for um december it could be um christmas hanukkah kwanzaa you know name a holiday um, and so they can do something built around a theme if they don't have their own idea. And then um, they can build something off of there um, or they can build something off of their favorite game or their favorite TV show um, and sort of take it from there. And then, you know, that might some of the kids then eventually develop their ideas into um, apps or businesses. Um, so that's kind of for them the next phase um, of their like thinking. Yeah. So I like this, uh, this idea that it's not one size fits all. Um, I think this is one of the criticisms you sometimes see with, um, with public schools, but I mean, along those lines, like, you know, there, I read there, are, there are waiting lists for coder dojo events. So, um, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a pent up demand for this type of education. And ideally we would see this in, uh, you know, public schools and, and wider scope of education, um, you know, ha start to implement some of these uh, ideas, but obviously that's that's less of a um, less of a scalable um, scalable thing with since it's, since it's one on one. And um, what what are some ways that public schools could uh, could take away some of the lessons from from Coder Dojo? Yeah, so I think uh, movements like. Hour of Code are always a good way to start where things already have a little bit of curriculum. Um, so that way, because I know, you know, teachers are usually pretty stretched thin. So coming up with curriculum or coming up with the activities is usually pretty difficult. Um, another thing is, uh, besides taking part of things like Hour of Code, um, implementing, uh, there's this other uh, great um, way of, I guess, uh, not thinking, but there's this other great way for like innovating and it's called genius hour so similar to like our code it comes from uh google it's it was created by a teacher 
Um, but the idea is just like how Google has 20% time, what if classrooms could have one hour to um, problem solve? Like kids can come up with um, things to problem solve and it doesn't have to be technology related. It could be a web app, but it could be, um, you know, something else. It could be civic. It could be, you know, as long as it's somehow related to their coursework. So um, Mm -hmm. like it could be research related, like something that allows them to um, be a little bit more creative and explore different ways of thinking, I think is also really great. Mm, So here we're getting at like a deeper problem within the old, old world of education that, that maybe could be solved Without you know the the domain specific knowledge of of uh, of a teacher that would know how to code something you know you can regardless of whether the teacher knows how to teach people to code you can teach people to to creatively problem solve yeah definitely okay very interesting so what are your thoughts on New York's initiative to have all public schools teaching programming in ten years do you think this is feasible? Um, I think it's feasible as long as we're not cutting out other things. That's that's been another big argument. It's like, oh, you know, we're gonna lose we're gonna lose arts to to science. And I think arts are totally just as beneficial to science. And so I don't think we should be cutting things out um, to make room for computer science necessarily. Um, I think it is a good initiative. Um, so, for example, if you, I mean, if you're if you're looking at just the numbers of you know how many jobs there are in tech and how few people there are to fill them, that's one way to look at it. But um, you know, if you compare the U.S. to, um, I believe the U.K. has done this in their school system and and has done a good job of starting to implement computer science, and um, they're they're doing pretty well with it, um, and they've had they've had a good amount of success. So. Um, I don't see why it shouldn't be implemented as long as we're not like cutting out arts in the process. What is the difference between art and science? Um, I think (laughs) that's a good question. Um, I guess I see science as, um, hmm, science as a way of like applying how you, uh, applying different methods versus like, I don't know. I think uh, arts is maybe a bit more, um, I don't know. That's a good question, actually. I don't think I have an answer because <laughs> they, they're similar. They're similar I, I think that's because there's no difference. Right? There's, I, I don't think, think there's, there's difference. a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Um, I think like, and this is actually gets to one of my beefs about public school education is like they have this disjoint notion of of art and science. Mm. You know, it's and, and you know in these. But whatever, Uh, you know, I have enough of me griping about public school education. Over Thanksgiving, I had a great idea for a web app. So instead of spending time with my family, I locked myself in a room and I started building this application using Express.js because I love full stack JavaScript. So I was testing my application locally and I was making great progress. So I decided to deploy it and share it with some of my friends and get some feedback. I used DigitalOcean. I signed up for an account using promo code SEDaily, and in 15 minutes, I had my app deployed to a server and running. It was that simple. This was really the first time I had used DigitalOcean. So if you're like me and you like building stuff and you have ideas for projects, Give DigitalOcean a shot. It is the fastest and simplest way to deploy an application that I've ever used. If you want to give it a try, go to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code SEDaily to get $10 in free credits. Check it out. You know, I'd like to talk more about um, the stuff that you're involved with. What is Geek Girl Web? Yeah, so Geek Girl Web is um, both kind of my online presence and... Um, my way of sort of sharing and, and giving back my unique blend of like technology, mindfulness, and um, just sort of, uh, yeah, technology, mindfulness, and being able to just kind of give back some of the stuff that I, I'm constantly asked about. So um, a lot of people ask me, you know, about learning to code. Um, people ask me, um, of you know, at, as like a as a programmer, as somebody in technology, how do you deal with having 
you know, so many things coming at you, whether that's, you know, like I, I co-founded a nonprofit and, you know, I blog or I have all these other things. And um, so some of the techniques and stuff that I've learned along the way and, and also sharing everything with a dose of positivity is kind of my my goal, because I know that there are a lot, there's uh, many, many articles about women in technology and learning to code and all of those stats. But I really wanted, um, I want my website really to be a place that if I had, if I had had somebody to be able to mentor me or give back, um, I want it to be from a personal level. So that's kind of what my, my website is. Mm. So speaking of women in tech, I did a week of shows about women in tech. And I, I wasn't sure, like in retrospect, I'm not sure if I approached it entirely correctly, but what are the biggest misconceptions around the conversation of women in tech? Hmm, the biggest misconceptions around the conversation about women in tech. Um, I think there is a big misconception that, you know, um, you know, speaking on just the movement and diversity in technology, I don't think it's just a numbers game or like you're just about numbers, which is what everybody's focusing on. And it's the pipeline, <laughs> it's the pipeline. but everybody is also what the metrics are currently, you know, tracking is the number of women entering computer science. And I'm like, well, what about the women entering boot camps or non-traditional education routes like myself? And um, so we're missing a big chunk of that. I think when you just look at that data, I think it's not just those numbers. I think it's culture. Um, so it's about creating a culture of inclusivity. It's about, you know, being aware of unconscious bias, whether that's job descriptions or um, within the within a company itself, recognizing like that things might be unwelcoming. And that doesn't mean you should always have to, I don't know, moderate yourself and feel like, you know, you have to, you know, walk on eggshells, but it's a matter of um, just being aware that people come from different backgrounds and have different, you know, points of view um, or acknowledging when behavior is like, hey, that that wasn't cool or standing up for somebody else. Mm. So at the beginning of my week of shows about women in tech, my perspective, you know, after doing some research about it and reading some criticism and stuff about it and like Ellen Powell, blah, blah, blah. I had this really bleak dystopian view of 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 women of of you know the state of things of like the number of women that were exiting the technology field and blah 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 and you know I talked to one of my friends about this and she was like you know you really should focus on more positive aspects because if you just focus on the bleak and dystopian stuff it's just you're not really helping anything so I don't know. It, I, I did like I did I did approach some of the dystopian aspects, but I I also tried to to focus on on some of the positive stuff, which which you the type of stuff that you just you just brought up. You know the the fact that the if you look at boot camp numbers and factor in that stuff, it's you, know, you probably get a more optimistic view. Yeah, definitely. And um, I also think that you know um, the women in tech you know, discussion is also kind of like under a microscope right now because, um, mm. and it's putting everything on a spotlight because it's not just women in tech, right? It's women in the workplace, right? So you talk about, you know, mm. uh, like the, there's like a pay gap and things like that. So I don't think it's, it's just a women in tech discussion either. I think it kind of spans a broader discussion of women in uh, women in the workplace in general. Um, it just happens that there are much lower <laughs> numbers of women in technology. And also, what was it? Somebody had said, well, you know, you, you put us like, uh, this was a, it was a guy at a conference and he was like, yeah, you know, um, you put us like awkward tech, you know, guys in a room and, you know, we just have bad social skills to begin with. So, <laughs> so maybe we need to like work on it overall. And um, he was, he was kind of laughing about it where it, it's like, um, you know, I, I don't know. I think we need to break those stereotypes in general of like, oh, you know, people in tech aren't really social because that also goes into women that goes into like, oh, well, women can't code or because you're feminine, you, you don't look like a programmer. Right. So it's, it's those stereotypes as well. You know, one thing I'm curious about from, from your work, you're, you're a developer evangelist at Squarespace and, um, 
you know, I am I'm curious about this because it's kind of similar to my role as a podcaster. You know, like I don't necessarily have to code these days. Like I can just podcast about it. But the more I do that, the further removed I get from the day to day, you know, minutia of coding. So I'm curious how you balance that. How do you, because as a developer evangelist, you have to have developer empathy. And if you're not writing code, you lose that developer empathy. I can speak from this personally. So how do you, I mean, how do you balance that? That's a really good question. I think um, being at technical events definitely helps balance it and they kind of, you know, reignite that passion and re inspire it. So Um, You know, when I do go speak at events or conferences, I do like to sit in on like the technical talks and get really interested again in like whatever framework they're talking about. And, um, you know, I might not be coding as much in my everyday today, but I definitely do. um, You know, I always have ideas for side projects and want to tinker with open source stuff and and give back in that way. Um, So, yeah, so it's it's definitely something you definitely it's a muscle you definitely have to flex for sure. Um, and, but the thing that I think about developer evangelism that really suits me is that, um, it allows me to check, uh, translate technical to non-technical and I enjoy the communication part. And which is why I'm sure you enjoy being a podcaster is because you get to, you get to communicate and like spread, spread, you know, these amazing stories of other people. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so are you coding much these days? Um, I think it's on my to-do list to learn Swift. I'm kind, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of on right now. So, um, look, I, the first four months of this podcast, I did like no coding. Yeah. So don't don't like feel bad. I no no. So I'm waiting for the weather in New York to get worse. So that way, I have no choice but to stay inside uh, when it's snowy. Because right for the, I realized like the few years that I've lived here, I'm like, man, I spend my weekends indoor coding and doing other stuff, and I wanted to get out more and enjoy enjoy the city and enjoy nature. So, um, I spent actually my summer like playing soccer and and doing outdoorsy things. So, um, yes, once the weather gets cold, I will definitely be coding with like a cup of hot cocoa. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. And, and and so I, I, you know, a couple of things, like I I went to QCon recently, which is this comp, the software engineering conference, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, and it did reignite some of my desire to code. And I had this really interesting conversation while I was there with a guy um, who I I was sitting at lunch with. And he said, um, he told me this anecdote of a guy that went to work at Microsoft Research. And this guy went to work at Microsoft Research and Microsoft Research put him to work kind of just like evangelizing and writing papers and talking about theoretical stuff. And he stopped coding. And, uh, And there was an interview with him at one point. And he said, you know, Stopping coding was the worst decision of my career. He said it totally just deflated his ability to to empathize with programmers. So th- when when I heard that, I was like, okay, wow, I gotta I gotta make sure I don't stop coding. Um, so yeah, it is interesting. Um, so you know, I, I've got a few few questions to to close off with. Um, do you think that everybody should learn how to code? Um, I think everybody should learn how computers and technology work. And if it interests them, learn to code. If it doesn't interest you, then, then don't. But I think, um, but it is a really good skill to have. I definitely encourage everybody to at least try it once. It doesn't mean you have to go sit through an entire CS 101 course. I think, um, if it interests you, interests you, try it. There's a lot of free online learning resources and, um, it's a great skill to have regardless of what your career is. So it'll always add value. Hmm. What's been the most surprising thing that you've learned while teaching kids to code? Um, the most surprising thing I've learned is that they, that kids just pick up things so fast and they are very easily passionate about things. So a lot of times, instead of seeing things as problems, a lot of the times they do start to see things as like interesting challenges to overcome. And I think as we get older, when we get frustrated and, you know, when we're learning to code or whatever it is, you know, we, we don't, we kind of lose that, that little spark of like, I want to get to the next thing. I remember when I was learning to program, I was so excited late staying up late at night to figure out how to solve a problem uh, just in my own time, because I wanted to versus now as an adult, I'm like, Netflix. Netflix sounds good. (laughs) (laughs) 
Do you think that's a is that like an inborn aspect of humanity, or do you think that's a that's a mindset shift? Like, if do you think it's this is just like something that kids happen to have um, because they happen to have that mindset, or do you think it's uh, is this something that like because of neuroplasticity or something like you biologically lose some of that ability to pick stuff up really quickly and get really interested in things? Um, I think you can definitely still get interested in things. I think it's a matter of life happening, right? Because you have so many other like priorities versus mm. when you're a kid, you have all this creativity and free time, right? Um, and then as an adult, you're like, you use a lot of your creativity towards your actual work or your a lot of your mental energy. So I think it's more of a matter of having that energy for mental energy to be able to to work on those types of things. So it's, it's as an adult, it's making time for creativity, I think. Hmm. Do you structure your life such that you have some like free time for creativity, like where you just block off sections of free time? Yeah. So I think that, um, having that on the weekends, like not touching the computer and being able to like write things or have, you know, rituals or habits, I think is really great for me. So, um, this way, those like rituals and habits, they, because they'll become automatic for you. So, you know, like making the bed, I don't have to think about making the bed because it's now it's my normal like daily routine. So now that it's a ritual, I don't think about it. I don't spend mental energy on it. And this way, you know, it, once you add up all those little rituals, right, like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, that becomes that could become like an hour of free time of mental energy that you have back. Um, so that's mm. kind of the way that I see like habits and rituals. And I do have that on the weekends. Like I like to, um, you know, take time and read. I like signed up for a, you know, library subscription at my local library because I was like, all right, you know, I've, I've got to get off the phone because once I'm on the phone reading, you know, on the Kindle app, then I check my email, then I check Facebook and I'm not, I'm no longer like disconnected. And like, it's nice to mm. disconnect every once in a while. Yeah, I don't identify with that at all. I never want to disconnect. <laughs> <laughs> so, so on one hand, I, I don't because I, I there's such a great community on Twitter online. I, there's so many great people sharing articles that I'm interested in. And it doesn't mean I don't I don't enjoy that stuff. It just means that sometimes I want to like recharge and, you know, take take a little screen break because I spend like eight hours a day on the computer. So. Yeah, well, I mean, OK, so that's interesting because um, I mean, you see kids interact with technology in in ways that is sometimes different than uh than adults or i don't i guess we're adults now or so whatever 20 somethings <laughs> millennials um but uh i mean what what are the differences you see like between how millennials like us interact with whatever what's the whatever what's the name for the post-millennial generation gen yeah gen gen n or something yeah. i don't know whatever um, wh how do they interact with smartphones and like, what are they doing? Have you ever seen a kid with a smartphone do something like really crazy that you wouldn't have expected? So I think of this in the way that I compare like my parents who are, who are much older, um, learning technology is they're kind of used to a prescribed way of learning, just like how we're talking about with school and stuff. So like they're looking for an instruction manual on how to do things versus our current generation and the next generation are like, let me click on things until something happens. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me Google this until I figure it out. And like, so my parents will still call me and say, how do I do this or that? And I'm like, you guys oh have God, Google, yeah. you have iPhones now. You can, you can check this out for yourself. Like I'm, I'm literally going to tell you what I learned from Google. Like, <laughs> so I think the next generation on one hand, it, it is a very, um, a generation that is expecting like immediate results sometimes because they're, they're used to it. Um, but on the other hand, you know, um, I mean, I guess our generation has started it is, is because we didn't fully come from there yet. We we still are OK, like, you know, with, if there's a little delay in figuring out stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. So are you, are you saying there's a little more impatience with these kids? Yeah, I definitely think there's a little bit more impatience. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know, they won't work hard or be creative. Like they're all, I feel like their generation is already raised into the mindset of being creative, of being unique versus like our generation. It was kind of still, it was still like, um, you know, as Seth Godin talks about in his books, like, you know, white picket fence and go to college, you're going to, you know, this is the path to success. And, and then everybody's realizing, you know, younger people now are realizing, Hey, 
Uh, what if my idea of happiness is different? Or what if I, I don't want that traditional path, you know? Yeah. And I don't know about you. I'm seeing like a lot of my millennial friends who have been hoodwinked by that the, that type of myth that, you know, Seth Godin points out, they find themselves like really like confused and disappointed with where their life has taken them, even though they followed all the directions, all the dummies <laughs> guides and stuff. Have you, have you been seeing that among your friends? Um, not as much among my personal group of friends, but I know in extended circles of like people that I, that I might've, uh, you know, worked like, I don't know, encountered in other parts of my life, they might be. Um, but another interesting thing is that I think technology is uh, like also fostering this generation of creators. So you look at like YouTube and Instagram and Snapchat and people who are creating their careers out of that when anybody like, you know, you said this to somebody like 10 years ago, like, oh, there's people who are going to just upload videos of themselves every single day and they're going to make money off of it. You would have been like, you're nuts. That's like, they don't have a big or audio or audio files. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> people have been like, you're nuts. Um, so we're definitely changing. We're like the, you know, our ideas of success. And I'm, I'm really excited to see what, uh, what that brings. Okay, last question. Who are the engineers that have inspired you the most? Hmm. So I definitely admire um, Grace Hopper. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Grace Hopper, um, there's a very, the like largest women in tech, like North American conference is named after her. I, I just went for the first time this year. There's There was uh, 14,000 women that went to this conference. So it was, it was huge and it was amazing. Um, so she was a rear admiral and she in, in the Navy, the U S Navy, and she is, um, uh, supposedly like hailed for coining the term bug. So like debugging stuff, um, which I think is pretty cool. And, um, she did a lot of really cool things. So I definitely recommend looking her up. Um, and then, uh, let's see who else. Um, I, I, I do really appreciate the way Steve Jobs was able to bring, you know, bring the importance of good design. I did read like a few of the Steve Jobs biographies and he's not as much of, in a sense though, he's, you know, also hailed as being a tech evangelist in a sense, because he wasn't, uh, he was the one helping bring, um, bring vision and kind of translate it to people. So in a way as like an evangelist, I definitely look up to him. Um, and then, um, Ada Lovelace, who is named as one of the first um, women programmers. Um, I think she is awesome as well. Um, so kind of uh, coming up with the blueprint for um, for like modern computing back back in like the 1800s, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so those are some... Pretty, pretty tragic story, Ada Lovelace. I know, I know. <laughs> well, Rebecca Garcia, thanks so much for coming out to Software Engineering Daily. It's been really great talking to you about developer evangelism and um, teaching kids to code and um, diversity and all this stuff. And it's been really great having you on. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff, for having me. And um, I can't wait to, to hear more of your podcast.